here. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here at the Art Fair Thursday series from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. EST every Thursday since the lockdown happened. I know a lot of things are uh, moving forward and changing. Uh, and so we're really glad to have you either on your computers right now and not out there protesting or not enjoying the sunny and beautiful, beautiful summertime in this hemisphere right now. Still admitting some folks in tonight, we have Sarah E. Brooke with us. I'm Carolina Wheat, Art Fair Curator and Director at Elijah Beach Showroom. I know that's been going around, but I don't talk about it so much. And I also have Director of Open Space here, Monica Werber. And I'm really glad that we can have this conversation despite a lot of the postponements, cancellations, and online viewing rooms that we've been subject to the last three months. Welcome. <laughs> Still getting folks in here. Sarah, how are you? How have you been? Where are you right now? I am fine. I'm doing well. Um, we're upstate in Kingston, New York, staying with a friend and mm -hmm. we are hanging in there. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for being here. These are hard times and also super important times. And I know that there's a lot of things to do and see and be active in right now. And I just wanted to thank everybody for uh, for being here tonight to have this conversation. Definitely, definitely. And uh, you've been really active still with your practice. I know that your work contains um, a lot of forethought, uh, plotting and planning for some of your site-specific locations. Mm -hmm. You discuss, um, you know, your practice and kind of being in three parts of public parts you know, this remote aspect as well as the installation and contained work that's within this space you've had shows at brick uh, field projects nars foundation you've been um you know in, in public spaces such as prospect park uh the riverside park in brooklyn and uh, crystal lake in New York as well. And you know, we're gonna look at some of these images, okay. yet, you know, how have you been faring right now, being pretty much indoors uh, and, 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 you know, where your practice revolves so much about being outside? Mm. Well, I'm, I'm actually able to get a lot of outdoor time right now upstate. Um, that's one of the reasons that we're here. We have a, a four-year-old. Uh, and so it's really, really helpful to have uh, a yard and some outdoor space for her to run around in. Uh, and I've actually been doing a lot. So before we were here, we were in New Hampshire and I've really in the last three months developed this whole new relationship with the woods, which has been really interesting um, and surprising and somewhat challenging for a desert loving person. Um, so I actually have gotten quite a lot of the outdoors, much more than I get in New York City, but it's been a, of a different sort. And I think it's actually shifted my practice some. It, it shifted your practice in, in what way? How are you responding to that um, additional outdoor time? <laughs> well, I think when I'm working in the desert, I'm typically looking, well, you don't have to look very hard. The, the vastness is everywhere and the expanse is everywhere. Um, and, being here in the Northeast, in the woods, we've been in, in pretty rural locations. Uh, I've been trying to figure out where, where the experience of expanse is communicated or how it's communicated. And I, I, this process sort of started with a residency that I did in Connecticut a year ago, um, also in June. So it was a very like verdant, lush time in this part of the country. And I started there trying to understand again, how that landscape is communicating this kind of expansiveness or openness um, that's not just literal, but also psychological, right? Or just that feeling inside you of like a spaciousness opening up. And I started looking for actual literal clearings in the woods. Um, you know, pine trees don't allow for a lot of undergrowth. So I was, I was sort of drawn to these little forests of pine trees um, and trying to set work up in there because more light was coming in. Um, but ultimately it was just kind of unsatisfying in terms of um, 
the kind of expanse as compared to the desert. And I realized that I was asking the wrong questions and I was forcing my agenda too much. And there was this whole world around me that I wasn't really listening to and wasn't really learning the language of. Mm. Um, I know one of the things that um, when you read about you or when you listen to you uh, speak before, you're uh, always acknowledging the fact you were born in Reno, Nevada, right? Mm -hmm. And the expanse of skies and the vastness you talk about in your work. I can see how being in the forest, I'm from Michigan, so I, you know, forest is, is my playground and mm -hmm. I can, I can see, you know, how that difference and how being from the desert informs your practice so intimately. Uh, and I know that sometimes when you've spoken, you also refer to a psychic space. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how, and you kind of, you know, touched it a bit, but being in the woods or being in this Northeastern hemisphere, uh, how has your psychic space been speaking to you? That feels like a dangerous question. <laughs> there. Um, well, uh, I mean, it's also, it's interesting to be in the woods in this particular time, right? Like there's a lot going on right now. Um, I would say one thing that I was actually having a conversation with a friend about was how the, the desert is a place of revelation, right? It's sort of like, it's big, it's grand. There's this kind of fanfare about what you can discover there. Uh, the woods are a place of mystery and layering and questions. <laughs> Um, and, well, and I think it's real to you, right? It's, there's so many interviews mm -hmm. that you have to unfold and unturn. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's also really a place of interconnectedness and maybe smallness in a way that is, is good for me to try to work with. Um, yeah. I, I think also there's something that's very simple about the desert and that's very pared down and that's very um, pure in a way, right? That's sort of easier to tap into the, the, um, the quality of that. And here there are so many different things in communication with one another, with each other all the time that it feels like a really different kind of attention. Um, and I think actually the way that is layering onto what this time actually looks like in terms of, you know, I have my art practice that I'm trying to keep going during this time. I also work as a psychotherapist. So I'm seeing my clients and we're talking about all of their like inner psychic landscapes during this time. And I have my family and I have a child and usually those worlds are, are sort of separated. You know, I have the studio, I have the therapy office, I have my home, but right now everything is just all together in this very small space. Uh, and I think there's been something interesting about the commingling of those energies uh, that feels related to the interconnectedness of, of a landscape like this that's not so pure and not so cl like clearly delineated. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I definitely can hear what you're saying in relationship to just our plain sight, that which is in view in the expanse of deserts. Basically, you see what you get. Whereas, mm -hmm. the, <laughs> and um, control, you can control what you're seeing. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that brings a perfect segue to, you know, kind of moving into, I know you prepared some slides yeah. to start looking at um, some of that vastness that you're talking about and how your installation based sculpture uh, attends to that space. And certainly the viewer the viewer's point of view. Sure. Do you want me to, to start that now? Yeah, let's go. Okay. <laughs> All right. So. Where is this? This is, this was in Oregon. This is in like Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was a residency called Playa mm -hmm. and it's on the Great Basin, which is 
uh, basically it's, it's like the geological feature between the Sierras and the Rocky Mountains. So it's this big basin that covers a lot of the Western United States that uh, used to be a prehistoric lake. And now it's this huge, huge, huge salt flat. The Great Salt Lake is part of that. Uh, and this, this site in Oregon where I was called Summer Lake was also part of that. Uh, what time of year was this work, uh, the, this, this was, documentation, this work? Yeah, early December. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very stormy. Um, yeah, often in the summer, this, this playa is, uh, it's like that cracked desert that you see, you've seen pictures of. Mm -hmm. Right. How long, so, these, can you speak just a little bit to the uh, relationship between the two objects that are, um, you know, focused in the foreground, the mountains in the back? I'm seeing lines in the dirt, or is that, you know, the intentional line of the, of the site? Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about the, the, the relationship between the two. Yeah, the lines in the dirt are where I walked through a very muddy landscape to place the structures. Uh, so when I was first experimenting with these two pieces, I was, um, I just sort of, I, I stuck them where I thought they would be interesting. And then I moved back to try to get at the angle that felt most resonant to me. And that's, that's really what these, these installations and these remote spaces are about. They're very short term. Nobody really sees them. They're just part of my own practice and my own, Kind of rituals in a sense. So I, I take these structures out there, I experiment with how they interact with light and how I align myself up to the structures and to the light and to the landscape to create these experiences of resonance within, within my body, but also this kind of psychic psychological resonance. Um, so you, how long do these stay here? Do you just keep them there and walk away? No, Almost. usually I, I, they're just there for the duration of uh, time that it takes me to figure out that alignment and where to photographically capture it most effectively. Mm. Uh, so these little trails are uh, sort of a result of trial and error that happened when I realized that because this playa was so muddy, you know, my footprints were everywhere and it was really getting in the way of the feel of the piece. So I, I tried to figure out how to walk in and out in two parallel lines and then walk far enough out of the frame to connect and then walk back over. Um, <laughs> so yes. It's uh, very moody as we were talking about uh, the other day. It's yes. Fantastic. And, and, and that work, like many others, you document and that documentation becomes an archival understanding of, you know, it happened, this sculpture, this space happen exactly. yet so many of the points of view that you share with your audience become almost different pieces every single time mm -hmm. even though the same uh structure i find that to be uh mm -hmm. really curious and, and yeah i can i can skip ahead uh just a couple of slides for a second and show you this which is another shot of those two pieces um this was actually taken so that previous shot was taken in the afternoon. This was taken in the early morning and it was after a snowstorm. Uh, but I brought the same figures out and installed them in the same location. Um, and it, it, yeah, the, the oh. final work in these pieces is the photograph that I show. And the photograph is really, it's not necessarily a photograph of a sculpture. It's a, a documentation of this particular moment in time where I, had a particular experience of resonance. Uh, I'll just, I'll go back and talk about these. Um, this was a piece I installed in Wyoming on a residency at the Gentile Foundation. Um, and again, with these works, I'm looking for that moment where I can line myself up with the landscape and the light and the piece in such a way that I feel like very, it's interesting. It's like a, a feeling of real physical presence and groundedness and kind of like potency in that presence. And then that feeling gives me uh, the capacity to experience this kind of widening of perception or, or almost like a dissolving of myself into the wider space. Uh, and, and also, 
I mean, there's, there's something about the conversation between external vastness and, and like planting something intentionally within that to unlock this kind of internal vastness that, that I'm working with. And does any of this have, you know, with this, the, the resonance and the internal vastness, there, one thing that strikes me about your work is these location, location, location. <laughs> I wonder how are you choosing your locations if not, you know, being commissioned in a public art piece or, you know, when you find a remote place to document these sculptures, uh, and, you know, what, what's that aha moment? What are you really looking for? Yeah, that might be hard to put into words. Um, hence the imagery. <laughs> <How's> that? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I typically, I, so these, these works almost always happen on residencies, particularly as someone who lives in New York City, usually. Um, I go on these residencies, residencies to have access to these landscapes to be able to do this work and do these experiments. And then once I'm in that landscape, it's really just a matter of exploration and finding the site that, that really feels like it captures something about that uh, tension and conversation between a real grounded presence and then a real expanded sense of, um, of, of, of self, right? Of like taking those, um, the rigidity of the categories that are in all of us and feeling kind of perceptually and experientially how those can be expanded and break apart and move into this wider space. I, I mean, that's actually sort of a good segue into this piece, which is the first piece that I installed in the Northeast. And this is, this goes back to the, uh, what I was describing at the beginning of sort of searching in the woods in Connecticut on that residency last year for spaces of vastness and looking in the pine groves and trying to find how I could work with expanse in the woods. And what I discovered was that the way I was feeling, like once I sort of got my own agenda and narrative out of the way, the way that I felt really connected to um, the language of, so I was basically looking for the moments in that landscape where I felt that sort of internal opening. And I felt that sense that I could experience myself as larger than these categories that I have internalized. And I realized that what brought me to that place was these, these sort of slants of light, these light beams coming through the woods. And so I found this little, um, I don't even know what it is. It's like a little mini mossy forest or something on the ground there. Uh, we don't have that in the desert. I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, it's like mini, mini, mini trees everywhere. Um, but the light was coming through in this way and making this beautiful little glowing world. And this was pretty early in the morning. Uh, and I decided to experiment with installing there because it felt like it held that, that same sense to me. It does. What are the materials that you're using? Is this like a translucent plexi that? Yeah, it's, um, it's a metal ring and it's an acrylic sheet. It's a translucent acrylic sheet. Mm -hmm. And they're balanced together. They're balanced. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> the moss helped you. I like it. Right, the mini forest. Yes. <laughs> uh, this is a this is a piece that I did in New Jersey, actually, in the Pine Barrens. Uh, and again, like trying to figure out, I mean, this, this was an easy one. This is very open in the way that the desert is. But I am, um, with my public art and with the art that I install in gallery spaces, like we'll talk about with the open source show, I am trying to figure out how to bring that language of the vast desert and the landscape into uh, either a, you know, a park for a public art piece or into a gallery setting um, to make it accessible to people who can't necessarily go and hang out in the desert. And, and also just as a way to figure out how to, um, like how all of the different languages of expansiveness function, right? And how there are so many different ways to experience um, that opening of, of what is possible 
for for us as people, what, what it's possible to be, how it's possible to live. I think it's also really telling that, you know, this work in particular, Pine Barrens, uh, how long was this one up, Sarah? This actually was up for a day and a half. So this was part of the Middle of Nowhere Festival. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I was invited to install this piece. Um, and this was the first piece of its kind that I did, which using the materials that I typically use for those very remote, very temporary installations, this was the first one of that kind that was um, actually seen by people or other people like walked up to it and had an interaction with it, uh, which was really different, which was different. It's, it's so telling too, because um, a lot of the adjectives that you're using to describe the work of, uh, you know, meeting this work and growing from um, the experience of coming across something that you wouldn't normally see in this expansiveness, mm -hmm. looking with and the, the work also has a conversation with the environment because of the documentation I saw of this work. There's a couple different shots in just the 24, 36 hours that was up that it doesn't even look like the same location. Right. The colors have changed mm -hmm. due to the sunlight, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the leaves with the water it changed due to some snow or something mm -hmm. like this and, it, and that that forever changing that only constant is change that kind of mm -hmm. meditative koan or moment that you can uh, be with the work and, and the landscape is really exciting mm. it yes i i mean i i try to create the works such that they are very very impacted by light and that you can experience a really different piece at different times of day. Um, this, uh, this is viewfinding. This is a public art piece that was in Riverside Park up until last fall. And, and here you can sort of see, I think maybe all of our faces are on the right side. I don't know how folks have this configured, um, but there is an image of the sun coming through the piece. Uh, and it just gives you a sense of how differently the experience can go based on your own kind of position and angle. So with the public art, I mean, similar to what I do for myself when I'm in these remote locations and I'm installing a piece that feels really resonant for me, with the public art, I'm wanting to install works that compel other people to move around them and to try to create their own resonant experiences of themselves in space, both physically and, you know, hopefully psychically, psychologically. So I, that's part of why I want to create works that are really impacted by light so that when you're there at that site, you really get a sense of the subjectivity uh, of the piece and how, where you're putting yourself and the time of day you choose to go, the time of year you choose to go is going to create an entirely different experience. So I, I'll say a little more about viewfinding or did you have a... Yeah. Well, yes, please, because um, I know the work was really powerful in mm -hmm. its mission to promote inclusivity and intersectionality with queerness. Yeah, so Viewfinding was in Riverside Park for a year, and it was a collaboration with uh, 26 queer poets whose works I engraved on these acrylic panels that were attached to the bench of the piece. And I put out an open call to queer poets and had about 250 submissions and selected 26 poems. The prompt was um, 15 words or less on the themes of self-actualization and transformation in a queer context. So I wanted the work to function as uh, kind of an augmentation of queer voices in this really public space. And we had, at this photo here. Um, we had a reading for the opening of the piece. We had a reading where many of the poets were able to attend and share their work. And it was just this really beautiful queer arts community gathering. Uh, it, later on in the run of the piece, we had an alternative pride uh, celebration, which was a, it was a queer arts festival for new multidisciplinary works um, created by queer folks who identified as um, 
with identities that were not necessarily part of mainstream pride celebrations. So like people who are sort of on the outside of the, you know, what's become kind of the, like the traditional pride parade kind of scene. Uh, and so we had these works performed that were about intersectionality and resilience and marginalization at this site also. And so it just, it became a really, um, really powerful space of gathering. And I think that's really one of the goals with the public work is, you know, to offer these individual kind of private reflective experiences of reconfiguring the way you've structured your like internal categories through perception and through light and through these physiological experiences of, of the piece and the landscape, uh, but also to bring community together and to be able to have um, have these sites for, um, yeah, for gathering and for transformation in a community context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Here's one more. This is a very cool day. This is when the sun, this is the Stonehenge day, when the sun set like right in the center of the piece over the Hudson River. This is beautiful. And this was up for about a year, correct? Mm -hmm. Was up for a year. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank I you. Remember, Sarah, I dare ask, <laughs> you know, how do you feel when or if ever anyone has related your work towards the work of the late Christo or, mm. you know, Goldworthy or Smithson Spiral Jetty or, mm -hmm. you know, when, when, when folks are talking about your public's um are you, your remote or, or public works have have you heard that from folks i mean seeing that they're pretty mainstream mm -hmm. how do you feel about that mm -hmm. i've i've gotten christo i actually i feel like i was the only person in the city who liked the gates in central park <laughs> i actually like really enjoyed that piece <laughs> i really enjoyed uh the experience of it i really enjoyed how it felt to walk through each of those gates and, and what the significance was. I, I, I thought it was cool. Um, Goldsworthy and Smithson are, are actually two of the folks that I, earlier in my career and in my journey as an artist felt very inspired by. Um, I think because I'm not working with the actual like physical elements of the landscape in the same way, I don't really get compared to them as much. Right. Um, no, I actually, I have my computer sitting on a book of um, Nancy Holt right now. So I've got the sun yeah. tunnels under me, which is, um, which maybe I relate to more. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly there's this, this kind of masculine dominance of the natural world narrative that goes with the, the land artists. Um, that isn't exactly what I'm going for. Although I do think there is, uh, there are elements that I'm certainly inspired by in their work. Certainly. Absolutely. It's totally I, I, that you would bring up Nancy Holt, seeing that, you know, maybe she's left behind those men. Right, exactly. Therefore, right. Yeah. <laughs> I really value that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll just, I'll talk about this piece uh, for a minute. This is a permanent work that was installed in Crystal Park, which is in upstate New York. Uh, it was installed this fall. Uh, this is a work in steel and glass. And it was my first time using either of those materials, which was, was pretty fun and satisfying. Um, these two shots of the piece show how I'm thinking about uh, a viewer's interaction with the work and how I really want to invite a viewer into an awareness that the work is designed for them to experiment with their alignment uh, relative to it. So each of these panels has a transparent window that's left unpainted that if you are in a particular position relative the, to the work, you can see through all of them. And it, to me, that was kind of a uh, that was sort of like a nod to viewers to pay attention, right? Like there's something that is happening here. There's something that you can interact with. Uh, if you wait 
for the sun to be right in line, like you'll get the, can you see my cursor? Yeah. yeah. You'll get, you'll get the reflection of the window panel in the prior panel, like on this glass below the windowed cutout and here like you'll see it at a particular angle and for me like all of these ways of playing with how the sun lines up with the piece are very much in line with the way i play with how i install the, the structures in the desert or in the landscape and how i want to be or i'm looking for that kind of perfect moment with them that's again super subjective and it's just about my own sense of of that alignment and of what feels like it really opens something up within me and wanting to create these spaces where other people can really play with that. Yeah, I, I, I was wondering, um, I have a question also in chat, I think is relevant. Uh, Liz Nielsen asks whether or not any of the colors that you're choosing for this particular work and, you know, as a spectrum and, and the prior viewfinding, are you thinking about chakras or is it related to chakras? That's awesome. You're presenting <laughs> the light, you know. The, yeah. Yeah. Hi, Liz Nielsen. Um, I love that question. Um, I wasn't, but I guess I will now. Um, I was actually thinking about um, colors in the progression of a sky, right? like a sky at sunset uh, in different landscapes, how, that, how, how you see all of these different colors if you spend enough time in the same place. And so I wanted each color to be one that would not be totally um in contrast to the environment that it was in right like at some point during the day at uh, in some day during the year the sky will have this color in it so i wanted there to be that sense of um of time and of landscape and and also of gradient right like the way that uh, uh, the sky progresses through these different color gradients as the sun sets so that was the thinking behind the color yeah, and, 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 and yet another conundrum in relationship to uh, uh, Leslie Falls I, says hello from New Zealand. Uh, she's asking, you know, we're really emphasizing that, you know, you might wonder whether the work is, you know, the actual sculpture that's placed in the space or is it the photograph and how do you negotiate um, either or or even in relationship to a capitalist market? Mm hmm. I try to be really explicit about whether something is uh, a piece that I've installed sort of privately for my own process, for my own ritual, for my own experimentation and experience, and that actually no one else is around or going to see. And a piece that is very intentionally a piece of public art or that is a sculpture that is installed in a public place. Uh, and, and actually the reason, I mean, it's been the process has sort of evolved of learning how to talk about these different kinds of work because also sometimes the works that I create in solitude are um, become like models for the public artworks, right? So there's that, there's that conversation that's happening too. There's an example of that a bit later on in the slideshow that I can talk about. Um, so in some ways they are two branches of, they're two branches of the same practice. Exactly. Um, all right, well, I will continue to this slide, which uh, is sort of a lead into talking about the solo show at Open Source with Monica, which uh, should have been up right now, right? Um, and it is, is when it does happen, um, is going to be working to translate some of these um, concepts of vastness and light and expansiveness that someone can experience in the landscape into a gallery setting. So that's something else that I try to do with my practice is figure out how to create indoor installations and sculptures that can bring a viewer, uh, help a viewer access that kind of vastness. Like what is the language that actually works in those spaces? And what I wanted to point out here with these shots is how the surface of the glass in this piece is acting both as a mirror and a window. So you can see the woods and the light reflected. You can also see through the piece to the woods beyond. And there's this way that there's kind of an integration of, 
uh, of the window in the mirror that does a really interesting thing, I think spatially and also conceptually. So I'm gonna, I have some slides now of works that I've done in gallery settings to give you a sense of that. Um, that would be great. And I know um, Monica would love to kind of chime in here. Hopefully we can have her um, questions as well and, and the conversation between some of the installation, the, 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 the white wall work. Yeah, you know, the, the white wall right. work. Yeah. 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 Um, thank you. Yes. So um, I, I, we have this space and maybe really quickly I wanted to say what, uh, how how I'm mean, really sorry that we don't have Sarah in the space right now is, um, and I can't have the show right now. We will have it so in um, in the future, so probably next year. Um, but I think I think I, I when I saw the work first in a studio space, like I think the great thing about Sarah is that she is um, working with the material and the space in the studio just as as much um, and inside indoors and with the light as much as she can work outside uh, and that was is one thing about the material that you're using I find that's very special um, but that, that also I thought was really special about our space it's like an indoor outdoor space basically mm -hmm. it's a garage with really wide open doors mm -hmm. where light is going to be a big part of the whole um, of, of the work right so yeah yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was one of the things I felt really excited, feel really excited about for the show when it happens too. And that was our intention for scheduling it in June was to have as much light as we could coming into the space that I could play with, um, with, with the install and figure out how to really, how to really capitalize on that. Uh, this piece was commissioned for the Brick Biennial in 2019. And this is an example of trying to translate that work, uh, th that language or the, like the work that I do in the desert in those, those landscapes into a gallery setting. So trying to communicate space and vastness and a kind of expansion or opening. Here's another one uh, with uh, fiberglass mesh that I did. I'm kind of playing with space. It's interesting. It's different to have walls, right? You don't have to like put everything in the ground. There's all these other attachment options and ceilings to hang things. That's also very different. I think that'll be a big part of the open source show is having things that are hung in conversation with things that are, that are more grounded. Mm. And there's also light bouncing back even more maybe in a space than it does. Right, exactly. Exactly, right. Outdoors, the light sort of goes one way. Mm -hmm. um, and inside you have all of these refractions and reflections and this kind of like more glowing containment thing that can happen, definitely. How are you affixing the, the mesh to the wall? It looks seamless almost. Mm, it's not, it was quite tedious. <laughs> I mean, it's a staple gun um, held at a precise angle and then like trimmed with an X-Acto knife. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, satisfying, but you know. Uh, here's another piece with, um, this is actually kind of an interesting precursor to the public art piece I showed you in glass and steel. This was a little bit of an experiment that I had installed um, in a gallery space uh, where I used to show the Vanderbilt Republic. But another example of that kind of alignment and light in an, in an indoor setting and the work being um, not in conversation with landscape but in conversation with the architecture. Right, which is something else that I'll be thinking about for the open source show. I think it's really beautiful. Thank you. Here's another piece, um, kind of playing with that language in an indoor setting. Um, this was actually a, a bit of a uh, sort of test run for that piece I showed you of uh, that brick, which was like the much larger scale kind of stacked hanging windows. And this piece showed it uh, at the art fair opening also. This was the piece that was there. Uh, and 
Yeah, again, uh, color gradient is something I use a lot because I think that it has, at least for me, it has a really inherent sense of spaciousness or vastness. And, and I like, yeah, I like the way that you can, uh, can layer gradients as well to create, again, like anything to make you aware of yourself physically in space, which I think can also make you aware of all of the other things that are going on inside of you. At least that's how it works for me. So that's what I'm trying to, to offer to others and to translate. This piece I wanted to include, um, this I also created when I was on that residency in Wyoming. I was in a really remote space. There, it was ranch land and there were um, barbed wire fences everywhere. And I was thinking a lot about Matthew Shepard. And this was a piece that I created uh, thinking about him, thinking about his death, thinking about that violence, thinking about the barbed wire fences as a way to try to make sense of what, what happened and the kind of hate and anger that went into his murder. And also to try to understand uh, or just process the landscape that I was in and how much of that story felt like it was being reflected back to me every time I walked out the door. Here are some detail shots of that. Sarah, are these found objects uh, from Wyoming? Yes, mostly. Uh, I mean, some of them are, right, there's a lot of sort of found like fence type material and wood that was around. A lot of the fences are also made from, um, from pine or cedar that's like hammered into the ground and then the barbed wire is stretched between them. So yes, a lot of it, um, a lot of the, the wood references that. And then, um, yeah, there's some rebar here. There's some piles of stones that I gathered. There's a stone uh, in, the, in the right side there, if, if you don't have your little people windows on the right side of the screen, there's a, a detailed view of that. Yeah, that was, that was an interesting piece. And I think bringing together uh, some of the like concrete physical elements of the landscape and of the fences and then trying to blend them into some of the language of expansiveness and in a way trying to like in the way that there's this there are these pieces of acrylic with the color gradients there's this mesh on the color gradient like these sort of little hints this copper mesh here of trying to provide some some relief or some space or some way of holding the story. I feel like there's always some sense of order too to these works. Mm, mm. Right? Is that something that you're thinking of when you probably, right? I mean it's it's like a way to try to make sense of things, I think mm -hmm. certainly in a way. Sarah, yeah. You know, I know this piece is um, dedicated to Matthew Shepard, um, who passed away. I, geez, I feel like it was over 20 years ago, mm -hmm. if not longer now. Um, and I, I know that you, you were a fellow at the Leslie Lohman Gay and Lesbian Museum most recently. And um, some of the work, if not all of the work that you're creating does have uh, essentially queerness mm. wrapped inside it as mm -hmm. you're creating these um, moments of reflection within the physical space. Um, how can you help us understand a little bit better how that queerness is uh, in, encapsulated within some of these structures and the order or the, the, the presentation that you're, the materials even that you're mm -hmm. working with? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So I grew up in the desert, which was amazing in a lot of ways. And my dad was a geologist. And so I, I also sort of learned how to understand the desert through his eyes as this real character in my life and really developed quite um, I, an intimacy that I feel very grateful for with that vastness and with that landscape and just learn different ways to see and perceive and understand the landscape and understand myself in relation to it. 
Um, and then I started to sort of hit a wall with my family and my community when I started to, to become aware of my queer identity. And the desert then became this space where I could go out into this literal vastness, this literal expanse, and through a process similar to what I've been describing through the works that I install, I kind of figure out a way to break down those delineations and those limitations within myself to experience uh, or, or like try to experience a sense of who I was outside of all of those limiting narratives. So, so the work, as I talk about it, is about um, trying to internalize that external vastness, which for me was a story of trying to come to terms with my queer identity or trying to figure out how I could fit all of these different parts of myself together. Like how do I open up a space that is big enough uh, or, or different enough or creative enough to put all of these things together, right? And I think that, you know, sort of going back to my work as a psychotherapist, like we all have these narratives that are internalized that really constrain us. And that's, I think our work, one of our main jobs as people to really try to figure out how to, how to free ourselves from those constraining narratives. And I think just to speak a bit to what's happening in the world right now, th those constraining narratives that we hold within us, I think are the things that we project outward to constrain other people. Right, like we need to externalize those because they're so uncomfortable and we need to, to, to other someone into holding that constraint for us. So I think about all of that stuff and, I, and I, I think about how I really want the work to be a space where people can come and, and try to open up a space within themselves to really go back out into the world and face what needs facing and uh, yeah, deal with these stories that hurt ourselves and hurt other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you said it really uh, magically. Uh, however, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, so, you know, basically the most extreme homophobia, transphobia, and otherwise is kind of this inner being within them that they feel uncomfortable with potentially their gayness, you know, sometimes. Or something idea. else, right? <laughs> Some other part of them that they're not willing to integrate. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. not always an exact mirror, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the works uh, here then, were created an installation within the, the walls of a gallery. Do you have more work that you're thinking about producing for the open source show you can share with us? Sure, right. Sure. Um, so I have some shots that were taken in my studio uh, not long before the quarantine. So this was in, in early March when I was trying to sort of put together and start experimenting with what I might use for the open source show. And basically thinking about, thinking about a couple of things, thinking about uh, this relationship between a mirror and a window and creating different pieces that could function as both and that really would compel a viewer to, again, move around and become very aware of themselves in space and their position relative to the light and the angles of the piece and uh, just really have kind of a rich experience of their own um, their own perceptions. I was also thinking about, as I said, how to translate the language of the desert landscape into uh, a gallery setting and similar to the way that I asked myself, like, how do I find vastness in the woods? I asked myself, how do I find that vastness in the city, uh, in this really dense urban environment? And what I discovered was that when I would see the sunlight come through a window and create a pattern on the window or the ground, like that to me felt like this kind of expansive space that I could step into. Like I got that feeling that I get in the desert of this, this opening. And so I started, um, Let's see, I think I have some more details here. 
I started um, taking those patterns of light and transferring them onto these acrylic sheets with like a matte silver paint that was reflective. And then I wanted to use the, the acrylic sheets with the patterning of that window light as sculptural elements in and of themselves. So I wanted them to be leaning and hanging and creating shadows and creating reflections and acting as windows and all of that. Uh, I also, I started experimenting with creating much larger versions of these windowed pieces, which, which perhaps will be part of the open source show. So basically I'm, I'm just imagining creating a really immersive, but also in kind of a spare way, like a deserty kind of sparseness, um, but in a way that really creates all of these different experiences for you to kind of come into contact with something that makes you have to think about your position and your perception and your orientation. So again, these are all experiments that were in process when, uh, when we all went into quarantine. Uh, but I wanted to show this little video here, which is kind of a neat example, I think, of the way that a piece can be in conversation, both as um, something that's reflecting and something that's casting a shadow and something that's act acting as a window through movement. And here, obviously, I am moving the piece, but a viewer could move themselves around the piece to orient themselves differently with, uh, with the light as it is interacting with it. I think there could also be the possibility of um, playing with a moving light source or also in, in open source having the sun, right, which will move and coming into the gallery space will create really different um, experiences of the work. And so one of the things I was excited about with taking the time for the installation was seeing, you know, where is the sun at different times um, throughout the day and how can I install the work to be in a particular conversation with that. And Sarah, I, it was really um, wonderful to, to be in the, in the, in your studio space too, um, because even if the space was very small and obviously, you know, like a lot of materials were in there. They were very organized and, and um, uh, yeah, there, there was a lot of different uh, things we talked about. And one of the things I think when you go back to this last slide, maybe there is like some things that we could look at a little bit closer. And those were um, <laughs> <laughs> some, um, somehow we talked a lot about uh, childhood and upbringing and how um, you, grew up very Catholic mm -hmm. and that a lot of the words that you used on these pieces and um, kind of also reflected on that. Yes, uh, this is very much an experiment that Mon Monica came to visit my studio and I sort of took a risk and left all this stuff up. Um, and, and it's good. I actually, I felt grateful for the conversation that we had when you came. So it's something I've been thinking about a lot in the work, but it's still very, it feels very nascent. Um, so you can see here, or maybe you can't, but there's this tiny little word that says transfigure right here. Um, and so, yes, I was raised Catholic. Um, for those of you who weren't, you know, Catholicism is a, a, a version of Christianity that's very, it's very material. It's very visceral. It's very bodily. Um, and so there are words like transfiguration transubstantiation, consecration, incarnation, that mean like the physical substance of something is transformed. And often it's transformed into something with more of like a spiritual potency. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot that I have left behind um, in that Catholic tradition. But that, like the power of that language is something that I've really held on to. And the power of that language to speak to what is possible within materials and within the physical world is something I've really held on to. And I think um, I've been thinking a lot about how uh, it's a very, in some ways it's a very succinct way to describe what I hope to accomplish through my art. Like I want to take these materials and I want to create something that holds an energy that's greater than the sum of its parts. 
and I want to, I want to, um, I want to put that energy into that material and I want other people to be able to draw from that energy. And so I've started to experiment with using some of these words that carry that, uh, that meaning and that intention and that history in the work. I, I don't know if it will end up being um, like the, the, the words in the work that will be the way that I try to integrate those ideas, but that is something that I'm working with now. And I've, I've worked with text before, like in viewfinding, um, and I, I definitely am excited by the way that text can kind of distill um, a point about the work or the meaning of the work. And I am looking for ways always to have those in conversation. Uh, but this is still something that is in process, but, but certainly has been interesting and exciting to work with. I know you showed that video, which was uh, really clarifying uh, how your process works in relationship to the light and the shadows. And that um, video had an opaque uh, block on it. And as you could see it in the mm -hmm. sidewalk, shape shifting it was really this fantastic. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you ever considered making something more translucent so the the light would refract the color of uh, on yeah, the Yeah, it actually does. It might be a bit hard to see, but uh, there is a bit of a pinky, like right here. Oh yeah, I see it. It gets a little bit pink, so that is possible. Yeah, the color does translate into the shadow a little bit mm -hmm. because it's a because it's a translucent paint that I'm using there. Mm. Mm. Yeah, the muted tone is, it is so subtle, it's so wonderful. <laughs> We're um, creeping up to 1900 right now, so I'm wondering what's next? I mean, we've got the solo show happening at Open Source, mm -hmm. uh, fingers crossed, soon, mm -hmm. uh, installed. And, yes. and um, uh, do you have any other public art projects in the mix, or are you working yeah, on another remote? Yeah, I am, I am actually, uh, so I left in my studio also a sculpture in process for uh, Poly Prep, which is a school in Brooklyn. Uh, I'm the artist in residence there. I, I was for the last academic year, um, and the sculpture was meant to be installed on their campus in April. It's being pushed indefinitely, but I'm working on a public sculpture for their campus, which will be up for like five to seven years, and also an installation on the windows of their main building um that will be kind of like a color gradient light interactive piece that will be up um i'm hopefully going to install that this summer so it'll be there when they when ever if they return to school um and i also uh i i'm a, a finalist for a permanent public art piece in the queen's botanical garden uh, and so I've been working on renderings for that design. And this is uh, based off of that piece that you saw in that I made in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And so it'll be very interactive with the light. Um, it also, the discs here are really not meant to be like a central monolithic sculpture. They're meant to be an invitation into a perceptual experience where the garden can really be, um, experience in a variety of ways based on the season and the time of day and the weather and your position and the sun and all of that. Um, and then I have it, in order to make it feel like more of a space of gathering, I have these crescent uh, concrete benches that are sunk into the ground that sort of create this space for you to, to, to enter into, to interact with the piece. Um, I also have, I can show this video sort of a time lapse of how the light would interact. And like, again, like the luminous shadows here, I really love the way that they were working uh, in that other little video that I showed. Mm -hmm. And so a similar talk about to, your moment. What's yeah. that? What's that? I was Carly? just saying, talk about your stone moment. Yeah, totally. uh, Just more stone moments. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of stone edge moments. Um, here's another detail of that. And then I have the other piece in the corner because it was, it was a little bit hard 
with the uh, software to capture the, the glow exactly. Um, and also the, the piece in the top right is a matte acrylic. So the idea is that this, this piece would be fabricated from an acrylic or a glass that was reflective so that it would have that quality of being both a mirror and a window at the same time but also this opacity gradient that kind of obscures the view and creates a glow dissolving into a window while the whole time the disc is reflecting back to you. Uh, and you can, also, you can also go into it. You can go under them, you can lay on the ground, you can look up at them. They're very much meant to be interacted with and to act as uh, like lenses or windows or mirrors to really enhance the experience of the garden. I'm so precarious place too they feel like uh, sometimes when you walk near a Stella you, you don't want it to fall on you um, but, it's okay they'll, um, be, they, they'll be structurally sound if they go in <laughs> we trust that <laughs> we counsel. We, the, um, how tall are those they look like they're, they're going to be good 12 yeah, 15 hope, no hope I mean due to some limitations with materials and engineering uh, the diam the biggest diameter we could probably get with glass would be about nine feet Mm, fantastic that's really without exciting. without a seam mm. ah right right yeah. imperial limitations yes <laughs> production 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 <laughs> um well this has been such a pleasure to speak to you sarah yeah thank Anna. you Thank you for being here and thanks for joining the Art Fair crew. I know you were one of the legacy <laughs> artists that we had on Art Fair and we're so happy to have this conversation with you now recorded. And for those who haven't followed Art Fair yet, please do and download the app and check out some of Sarah's work. And, and so many other artists, we've, we've actually maxed to over 500 professional artists. Wow now on Art Fairs. We're really happy about that. And we'll be back next week and Thursday with Gabriel Cohen, artist from LA. And uh, we'll continue the, the, the artsy conversations. Awesome. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you again, Monica Sarah. and Carolina. Yeah. Good to see Perfect. you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone for being Great here. to see you and hear you. Hey, voice. good to see you too. Thanks. Thanks All for right, coming. Everyone. Stay safe. Sure. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. <laughs>